Well, good morning, church. It's great to be back with you after uh, being down in Florida for our conference last week for the Alliance. You know, it's funny, even if I miss one week, it feels like I've been gone for a month. And uh, uh, it was a great time. It was a refreshing time. It was a reminder that with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, we are a Acts 1-8 family with the emphasis on family. And so while we were there with the larger family of the Alliance, I was really missing being connected with the family here at Crossview. Really thankful for everybody stepping in and stepping up for Mel Pagar, bringing us the word last week. And it's exciting to be back with you. Uh, you know, I'm a person who has to impose routine on my life. Because I'm normally a, a highly relational, unstructured person. And so routine imposed upon my life has helped me to make some sense out of life. Otherwise, it can get pretty chaotic. But sometimes it can be dangerous if the routine that we impose in our lives begins to dictate how we live. This is a problem because the structure is to help us to become more efficient, but when the structure becomes paramount, it becomes an enslaving factor in our lives. And we don't want the, the structure that can be beneficial to us to become something that binds us from the very purpose that we have. You know, when I think about church, you know, I get excited about coming to, for corporate worship because there's an expectancy that as we gather together that God is going to do something in our midst, that we're going to encounter the Lord, that we're going to experience God in a fresh and new way, and that God will work in a powerful way in our lives. He will minister to us through the Word, and He accepts what we bring in worship. You know, it's interesting because worship is not about what we get out of the service and the music, but what we bring and we offer up to the Lord. So no matter what your musical style might be, what we have when we come in here is our worship to offer us up to the Lord. You know, the whole aspect of, of routine and, and, and structure uh, is, is good, but sometimes we just need a break and we need a vacation. But have you ever been on vacation and you needed to have a vacation to recover from your vacation? <laughs> you know, that's something that we all encounter. And so lots of times that when we think of Sabbath, the word rest comes up. But sometimes in the whole concept of the Sabbath, it's like, well, it's the routine. And so we're struggling between two things, routine and structure and experiencing God's rest. If you have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28, as we're going to continue in the series, Surprised by Jesus, today looking specifically at the Lord of the Sabbath. You can follow on the screen, read in your device, or open up your Bible as we read from Mark chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. One Sabbath... He was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him, and how he entered the house of God at the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence? which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those that were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would open up your word to our understanding today so that we would not only see it, but we would be able to understand it and perceive it and apply it in our lives so that we can draw near to you, experience your presence, and have a transforming impact in this world. Show us how to apply it, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, the main idea that we're looking at today is that Jesus is the source of peace and rest. Jesus is the source of peace and rest. You know, often in the world, we look to find a source of peace and rest in so many things. It could be activities. It could be false uh, gods, idols that we prop up thinking that they're going to satisfy. We wouldn't call them those types of things. It might be that we seek peace and rest in a relationship, peace and rest in a job, peace and rest in our financial situation, peace and rest in a multitude of things. 
but Jesus is the source of peace and rest. And as we consider the simple actions of Jesus that we read about in the passage earlier in his disciples, there was an incorrect religious thinking that was revealed by the Pharisees, and that was seen in the accusation that they leveraged against Jesus in verses 23 and 24. The accusation. Jesus and his disciples, the accusation was that Jesus and his disciples were lawbreakers. That they weren't serious about religion because any person who is serious about religion wouldn't be breaking the laws that we have on the books. You know, because we're a law-abiding uh, nation in Israel and we have the laws of God. And so anybody who's not following those laws is a lawbreaker. That was the accusation that was leveraged against Jesus and his disciples. We read it in verses 23 and 24. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? Now, there are a couple of things that we learn from this. First of all, they were accused of being unlawful or breaking the Sabbath because of plucking the heads of grain. You know, they were gleaning grain. And that was a problem for the Pharisees. The, the Pharisees had a problem with this because... It wasn't a problem in and of itself. As a matter of fact, if we read in Deuteronomy 23, 25, it says that if you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. You see, the fact of gathering grain wasn't the main issue. They could, as they were going along the way, as they were passing through the grain fields, it was completely permissible in that day to go through and, and break off uh, you know, the heads of grains. And so what they did is they would take the heads of the grains. It was probably wheat or barley, the most common grain in Israel at that time. And then they would rub it and, uh, and, and remove the husk. And then they would have a little snack as they were the, walking through the fields, as they were walking along the way. It was probably a, a beaten path out in the countryside. Obviously, there were some Pharisees that were walking along with them. And so they had this process of, of gleaning the grain and rubbing off the husks. So it wasn't considered theft because they were doing it while they were passing through. They weren't out there harvesting their neighbor's grain. They were just walking along. And that was a way of, of providing for the needs of an average person that didn't have you know, uh, convenience stores to stop by if you were hungry and needed a snack. It was not to take advantage of your neighbor and steal from your neighbor, but also it promoted um, a, a generosity with the things that we have. Sometimes we can be so tight-fisted with the things that we have that we don't want to share with anybody, but the Bible teaches a, a spirit of generosity, and this was manifested in the aspect of gleaning. We read about this in other parts of Scripture. In, um, in the book of Ruth, where Ruth came back to Israel from um, the region of Moab and with her mother-in-law Naomi and they were poor. And so Naomi sent Ruth out into the fields of uh, the man named Boaz where she was able to glean and that was a, a way of providing for the poor. So a, a person who was traveling or a person who was poor, they could, they could glean grain. And there was not a problem with that because it wasn't considered theft. But technically, it could be considered work. Technically. You see... The, the point that we see here is that there were some extremes that are a danger. One is there's the extreme of danger of legalism. is where we follow the law so much that that becomes the object of our whole purpose is to obey the law. But in the same way that I talked about my illustration earlier, structures that, that I impose upon myself are for my benefit, but when the structures become Restra uh, you know, uh, a problem, it, it, they lose their point. The laws had a point, and the point wasn't to follow the laws. The point of the law was to show us the holiness of God. And so there's an extreme of legalism. But we also need to understand that obedience to the law is not legalism. Thinking that we are justified because we are so good at keeping the law is the problem of legalism. So well, if a person says, oh, I want to live how I want to live, I want to do what I want to do because I don't want to be one of those legalistic people, that's an extreme of saying, no, you just don't want to do what God says, and there's a problem with that. But this other person says, hey, I'm really good at this, and I follow this law, and this law, and this law, and this makes me so much better than everybody else, that's a problem too. 
Because the reality is, is they're cherry picking the laws that they're good at to say, hey, let's evaluate me on, based on what I'm good at. So there are these two extremes that we need to avoid. And, and so this is the context of the accusation that the Pharisees are making against Jesus and his disciples. So the issue wasn't the issue of gleaning the grain. The, very, the real issue was the issue of breaking the Sabbath in verse 24. It says that you're doing what you ought not to do on the Sabbath. Look, why are you doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? This is the problem. You're a lawbreaker. The problem was the issue of working on the Sabbath. And that goes back to uh, Exodus uh, 34, 21. It says, six days you shall work, but on the Sabbath, seventh, you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest time, you shall rest. Now, in an agrarian culture, farming is very important. When the harvest is ready, you've got to get the harvest in. But God didn't make exceptions even during the planting time or harvest time. He said, you need to take this time, the Sabbath day of rest, because it's important. Why was this important? Because God had put this this law on the books for the benefit of people. And they had ignored God's laws. They had ignored the, the principle of the Sabbath that he had established. And that is what previ previously provoked his discipline on his people. You see, Jesus is living in the time of the second temple. And the first temple was destroyed because the people of Israel didn't honor and respect God's Sabbath. And so the temple was destroyed. The people were taken away in exile to the country of Babylon for 70 years before they were restored. So the fact that the, the people of Israel had rejected the principle of the Sabbath and had ignored God's word had resulted in discipline for the people. And they were taken away and they suffered discipline. So this was a problem. Now, what happened was is that the Jews had learned from this discipline. When they were taken away to Babylon, they no longer had the temple, which was the center of worship for the Jewish people, where they did the sacrifices. So it was during the exile time in Babylon where the birth of synagogues came into place, where they could gather together as a, as a gathering of Jewish people in their identity, even though they couldn't do the sacrifice because the sacrifice had to take place at the temple. Now, when you're in a foreign land and you're away from the center of worship, you come to understand that God was serious about this. And so as a result, they said, we don't want to be fall back into these patterns that got us into this discipline in the first place. And so they started building these hedges around the law. The problem was the hedges and the rules and the regulations that they put around God's laws to keep them from breaking God's laws. Now, it's interesting, they did this by creating an external thing that was not in God's law to keep them from breaking God's law. And whenever we create these external fences to surround God's law that don't flow from the heart, it can become a serious problem. And so the issue was not that of keeping the Sabbath. The issue is what was the heart condition and the exaltation of these external hedges that, they, that were created by man to keep people from breaking God's laws. And so it was motivated from a good place, generally speaking, but they had lost the heart of the issue of knowing God and honoring God with the principle of the Sabbath. And so what we see, the, the precedent is the, uh, in the, the phrase that they said, what is not lawful? You see, this whole aspect of the hedges was described in the Mishnah. And the Mishnah is the uh, oral traditions of the rabbinic literature. The rabbis following the exile of the Jewish people to Babylon started writing down these extra classification. They actually had 39 classifications for work to build these hedges so that they didn't fall into breaking the Sabbath. And so they had four of these regulations were related to reaping, winnowing, threshing, and preparing meals. And so it was interesting, God gave the law, but the Mishnah and the rabbinical tradition said that we're going to make sure that we don't do anything that gets close. And so even a casual activity could result in breaking the laws. But it were, they were the laws of men, not the laws of God. The God's law was talking about the Sabbath, but they're talking about the Mishnah and the rabbinic traditions about what does it mean to do work. So...
You weren't allowed to harvest on the Sabbath according to the word of God. But the, the Mishnah implied that even rubbing the husks off those grains as you're walking through the field could be classified technically as work according to the traditions of the rabbis at the time. You're starting to see the problem now? They had set a precedent that went beyond what Scripture said and were using that precedent, that human precedent, to evaluate Jesus and his disciples. You know, it's interesting. I think about this in my own life. Um, when I was in seminary, there was a standard that they had in order to encourage students to respect the principle of the Sabbath. You know, you're in college, you're in graduate school, you have kids, there's a lot of pressure on your time. And so the temptation was for these students who were in seminary studying the Word of God was to work all day Sunday preparing their papers that they had to turn in on Monday. And so what they did is they had a, a, a rule that we couldn't write any papers, do projects, or read any textbooks on Sunday in order to promote this principle of respecting the Sabbath. We could read the Bible, we could uh, engage in fellowship, and we could do acts of service. But it was interesting that they wanted to encourage us to apply God's Word and the principle of the Sabbath, but they did it through these external uh, regulations that we had to assign to. So it was kind of interesting, the irony that was taking place, something that was very good. But the whole process was a little bit questionable. Now, how many people would love to go out after church today to your favorite restaurant, the, the ordained restaurant in all of Christendom of Chick-fil-A? <laughs> of course. And you will be gravely disappointed because Chick-fil-A is closed on Sunday. Because not out of a legalistic reason, but out of a desire to honor a principle of the Sabbath. But it was interesting to see when a crisis broke out several years ago with a mass shooting down in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub, which is a, a nightclub that would honor activities that were totally dishonoring to Christianity, Chick-fil-A opened up and began to serve on Sunday because it was such a, a horrible situation and it was an opportunity to serve the community. So here's a, a, a good example of a principle of people applying the principle of the Sabbath to their workplace, but not letting that principle that they imposed upon themselves keep them from doing the good that they needed to do when they saw a situation that they could minister to the community with whom they were philosophically in disagreement biblically in disagreement because they wanted to show the love of Jesus to people who were different because it was the right thing to do to help out at that time. You know, I think of uh, back in the day when I was growing up, they had something called blue laws. And the blue laws meant that grocery stores were closed on Sunday. All businesses were shut down on Sunday. And I remember because this was, became a, a conflict with my extended family because most of my extended family were Seventh-day Adventist. And they worshipped on a very strict Saturday Sabbath or sundown Friday to sundown Saturday. Now it was interesting because there was great pride in the fact that they were keeping a Jewish type of Sabbath and these blue laws on Sunday, they were saying that was an evidence that there was a, there was a, a disrespect of, of the Sabbath as well. So it was interesting to see some of these conflicts. A, a real positive standpoint is they wanted to honor God's day set apart, but also the, the inconsistency of how they applied that, those, those principles across the way. Well, it's interesting because Jesus responded to false accusations by looking to the Scriptures to respond. And, he, and looking to Scriptures to discover the actualities, which were revealed in verses 25 in 26, we see the actualities. Continue to read. And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? And those that were with him and how he entered the house of God at the time of Abishar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. It's interesting because as Jesus is remembering David, He's looking back to the passage of 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 6. And if you read that passage, you'll discover that it was actually uh, Ahimelech who was the priest at the time. But Ahimelech was assassinated, and his son uh, Abathar became a prominent priest. And so Jesus is using the name of the son 
Abathar, who was alive afterwards and went with David and had a prominent priesthood ministry, to put the context for the Pharisees of something that they know. He said, have you read? Well, they're Pharisees. They study scripture. Of course they've read. They knew that story very well. And so Jesus uses this, this, this device of saying, have you read about what David did to make that connection, that Davidic connection, remembering David? What happened with David in that passage is David was unjustly accused by King Saul and was being pursued by King Saul. And that's why he had to run away. He had to, to get some food for his, the guys that were with him. And they stopped by and the priest gave him the, this showbread, the bread of the presence. And only the priests were allowed to eat that. That would be up on the, the temple as a reminder that God is the God who provides. And then afterwards they would change it with hot bread and the priest would eat the the, the other bread, it was the priests would eat it because they were consecrated, set apart. And so David wasn't, and his, his, uh, his, the guys with him weren't technically allowed to eat that. But because they were in need, he asked, and the priest said, are the, are the men holy? Have they abstained from, from immorality? And he said, when we're out to war, we're always uh, abstaining from these types of things. And so he gave them the showbread. And so that's one of the contexts is that he was being un, unjustly pursued. And Jesus was doing what David did. He was being unjustly accused. And he used this looking back to David to help them see the reality of what was going on. But also we see that in this situation they, that, uh, he, that David was viewed as being threatened by King Saul. He was being unjustly accused by King Saul, but he was being threatened by King Saul. King Saul was pursuing him. And the Pharisees were acting just like King Saul. In the same way that David, Jesus was acting like David and providing for the needs of those with him, the Pharisees are acting like King Saul, falsely accusing Jesus and looking to bring cause against him as a Sabbath breaker as well. They were lacking the perception of what they were really doing. But you see, not only was Jesus referring back to David to, to help them con, uh, understand what was going on, that context provided some perceptive and perspective for them as well so that they could comprehend what was going on. You see, the, the, the showbread was provisioned for the priest and it was set apart. But the peril of the people or the hunger of humans Human need necessitated a precedence over the ceremonial formality. You see, the showbread was a formal aspect of the ceremonial worship, but David went in with his guys and they needed food, and so the human need took precedence over the ceremonial formality. And so Jesus is using that example to show the Pharisees as well, is that the human need, the need of his disciples, the hunger that they had took precedence over the ritual formalities of technically working on the Sabbath based on human hedges around God's laws. See, God's law said don't harvest. It didn't say don't eat or don't glean the grain if you're hungry. And so Jesus puts things in the proper perspective and context. You say, well, what does this mean for us today? How does this relate to us today? Well, yes, this was taking place in an Old Testament theocracy. And then that Theocracy, that means that God was the head of Israel. He was the one who was in charge. It wasn't a democracy where everybody had a vote. It was a theocracy where God was in charge and he set the rules. And he established this, these rules for a purpose so that the people could know God and walk in holiness in a context that was vile and contrary to the very things of God. And so he established these laws to protect the people and so that they could know him. It wasn't rules for rules sake. It was rules for their protection and rules to push them towards intimacy with God, to see that God is holy. And so they had exceptions. If your ox fell in a ditch on the Sabbath, you didn't let your ox die. You could work on the Sabbath to get your ox out of the ditch because the Lord wanted there to be relationship. It wasn't about the rules for rules sake. As we read earlier in previous weeks about Jesus healing the man of, of, of demons on the Sabbath in the synagogue. You see, Jesus cared about people more than the ceremonial formalities. Well, Jesus turned the Pharisees' world upside down by applying insight to reality. 
This truth resulted in the adaptation we see in verses 27 and 28. He said, And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. You see, Jesus wasn't a Sabbath breaker, but rather the creator of the Sabbath. And he turns the Pharisees' worlds upside down with this. Jesus highlights the principle of the Sabbath in verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Religion religion is more than rules and regulation. The focus is love and forgiveness and service. It's more about the do's than it is about the don'ts. You see, we often like to, to refine Christianity and religion down to don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, when it's really about do this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Reach the lost. Fulfill the Great Commission. That was so exciting to be down in Florida, to be a part of the Greater Alliance family, 3,000 people, where we are saying our mission is the deeper life and the power of the Spirit, the Spirit-filled life, knowing God intimately. And the overflow of that intimacy with God will result in reaching the nations with the gospel. You see, it's all about the do's and not less about the don'ts because when we're doing the do's that God gives us to do, the don'ts don't get done. We're focusing in on the relationship, and there's this expectancy of encountering Christ and being transformed by the living Lord. That is a passionate message. That is a message that we have in the church. That is a message that needs to be manifested in our lives. And if that is the case, and that flows out of this building into the community, our churches will be packed as they see transformed lives of people who have been transformed by the power of Jesus, not stale religion but life-transforming relationship. You know, Jesus, he refers to the, the created order. He says, people were made before the Sabbath was established. This phrase is only used in this gospel according to Mark. You don't see it in Matthew and Luke. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Man was created before the Sabbath took place, and God instituted the Sabbath for, per, the, to, for man's good and for his glory. Now, human need over religious ritual is so vital. Mercy is permitted on the Sabbath. People matter more than the system that is designed to help people because God loves us, and he wants us to love others, all of humankind. It puts us in that situation where we have the letter of the law, and the letter of the law is is important and good, but the spirit of the law is what takes precedence over the letter of the law, and Jesus highlights that. Jesus never compromised the letter of the law, but he always penetrated through the letter to the purpose and the spirit of the law. And he does that with the Pharisees here, highlighting that legalism is more than just the letter. It is the spirit. Jesus defines things. You see, rest is found in Jesus. He is the source of rest and peace. Rest is not found in ritual, in empty religion. And also we see that the principle of the Sabbath highlights the benefits of the Sabbath. You know, God gave the Sabbath so that humans could rest from their labor. Man, we could work ourselves to death. You know, I I would work seven days a week, just how I'm wired. But God gives this principle of you would kill yourself I wouldn't, I'm past 50, so I'd already be dead. I'd already worked myself to death if that's the case. But so the Lord gives us the Sabbath so that we can have a break from the physical labor to have the rest that we need. He gives us the Sabbath so that we can experience the blessing of corporate worship. Do you have the expectation on Sunday morning that I get to go to church? I don't want you to feel like I have to go to church, but I get to go and gather with other believers in Jesus to worship the Lord, the creator God of the universe who loves me and has made a provision that I can know him forever through faith in his son who died on the cross for my sins. Man, that gets me excited. So that's why it was kind of weird not being here last Sunday. I I love being in the presence of the Lord with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And also the Sabbath has a benefit of helping us to align our priorities. Because there are so many things that can distract us. We can be driven by so many things. But the principle of the Sabbath says, 
The Lord is our number one priority. Let us focus on Him and worship Him. And that protects us from the seductions of, of the world and of the, the materialism and the self-gratification where we put ourselves on the throne as king when Christ is the one and the only one who needs to, to occupy that place. But in addition to the, the principle of the Sabbath that we see in verse 27, we also discover that Jesus declares definitively in verse 28 that he is the person of the Sabbath. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the person of love and power. Jesus is Lord. And that is the declaration that was used by the early church. Jesus Christ is Lord. And what does that mean? What does that mean that Jesus is Lord? It means that Jesus is not only the person of love and power, Jesus is the person of authority. He has the final voice about the Sabbath. So it's not the man-made rules. It's what he says about the spirit of the law and the purpose of the Sabbath as well. And why does this matter? Because it emphasizes intimacy and relationship over the externals and the rules. God wants us to know him intimately and in a way that transforms us so that we can be a transforming impact in the world around us. What difference does this make for you and for me? It serves as a reminder that we're not in charge and that Jesus is. And that the Sabbath was given for our good and for his glory. You know, it's not about the creation, it's about the creator. It's not about the law, it's about the lawgiver. Jesus is the gift to us. When we have Jesus, who is the redeemer, we have redemption, we have everything that we ever need. Jesus is our source of peace and rest. If there's someone here today who doesn't know Jesus as Savior and Lord, who have never trusted in Him for forgiveness of sin and eternal life, let Him be your Sabbath rest today. Let Him be your peace. Let Him be your Savior so that you can know the peace and rest that comes through forgiveness of sin and eternal life that is found only in Christ Jesus. Don't put it off. I'm not talking about being religious. I'm not talking about church attendance. I'm talking about a relationship with the God of the universe. If you've never done that, come in and invite Christ into your life today. What's your next step? If you're not a believer, come to Jesus and let him be your Sabbath. If you are a believer, what are the ways that you can honor Christ with the principle of the Sabbath in your life, not just on Sunday, but each and every day to honor him as Lord of the Sabbath and as Lord of your life. Right now, we're going to be transitioning to a time of the Lord's Supper. And this is a, an exciting time as we, we celebrate the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, remembering the Last Supper when he was with his disciples. And he instituted the Lord's Supper and declared us and commanded us to, to do this until he returned. So it is a reminder that Christ not only died for our sins, but rose again and is coming back again. This is the Lord's Supper. And so I invite you to participate. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, this is a holy meal. And so if you haven't made that commitment yet, I ask you to, to kindly refrain. But if you do know Jesus as your Savior and Lord and you've trusted him, feel free to partake of this, this meal. It's a time of where we can have confession as well. And I'm going to ask the, the elders to come forward as we prepare for the Lord's Supper. And what we're going to do is, in just a minute, we're going to have some prayer. And then the, the elders are going to distribute the, the, the elements, the, the bread and the, and the cup. And after the bread is is distributed, hold on to it, and at the end, we'll, uh, we'll take it together, and then they'll distribute the cup, and then hold on to it, and then we'll partake of the cup together. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we prepare to take, partake of this meal, we acknowledge that we're sinful. We've fallen short of your standard of perfection, and even as Elder Barry prayed earlier, we confess that we don't cut it.
But we thank you, Lord, that you are a merciful God and that you have made a provision. And so we come before you and we confess that, that we fall short of your perfection, your glory. But Jesus completed that standard completely. We thank you that you have made provision for our sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we acknowledge our sinfulness and your faithfulness and goodness. Lord, we consecrate ourselves now. And we ask that you, through this time, would work in our lives for your glory. That we might live lives that are holy and honoring to you. And the power of your spirit so that we might do the things that you want us to do as an overflow of being forgiven by your amazing, amazing grace. We give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.